We'll open a set of files that contain high resolution spectra that have been acquired from a set of samples that are very similar in composition but have different proportions of different materials. So I'm going to merge these into a single VAMAS file so we can see these high, high resolution spectra and the one that is of particular interest is the C1S signal and this is because for XBS when you have a bond between carbon and oxygen a double bonded C1S electron appears at a different binding energy to the single bonded and this actually is in contrast to what happens when you have sodium ions so if we go back to our data set you can see here we've got the oxygen bonds and probably more than just oxygen bonds that are causing shifts in these peaks here of over several EV for the carbon 1s whereas if we look at the sodium in fact let's normalize it so you can see clearly that there's hardly any movement at all within the sodium and what movement you see here may well simply be difference in the in the charge potential of the surface when these different samples were measured so Carbon 1S contains chemical state information. There are other reasons why it's very nice to have such a peak as this carbon 1S, that at a, all the information is being acquired at the same kinetic energy. So transmission, you've also got the same re relative sensitivity factors, very little differences will occur between photo emission from different bond states of carbon 1S. So you've got lots of reasons why a carbon envelope is a good source for chemical state information and quantifiable information within XPS. The next question is how to extract this chemical state information. And the traditional way of doing this would be to create a peak model. And this would involve choosing a spectrum, placing a background on the spectrum, then adding a set of peaks and these peaks, each one represents a different chemical state within the carbon 1S. And this is the amount of these different chemical states will also be represented by the peak area. So we keep on adding these peaks. And when we think we've got enough peaks and we can justify the binding energies of these peaks and the full width half maxima, we say fit. And we end up with a peak model from which we ought to be able to say that we've got something that might be a CC type peak and maybe a CO peak here and we would try to make some sort of interpretation of the data for these samples based on these shifted C1S peaks. Now if you look however at the range of possible shapes within these data and you appreciate that all of these samples ought to have a similar composition or but in different proportions then a simple model created like this is really quite difficult to justify however what we're about to do is show a means of trying to extract more detailed information from a set of spectra such as these by looking at different spectra that are calculated from these carbon S spectra so they give a different perspective and while this may sound odd, that you might think that a spectrum from a sample is always a spectrum from a sample and it will be the same, that's not true in XPS. Had you tilted the sample, then the amount of contamination on the surface, or if there's any in-depth distribution of these materials, then you would find there'd be a change in the, the shape of the spectra and the proportions of these different carbon OS 1s peaks. So what we're doing is mathematically trying to get an alternative perspective of the sample. That's one way of interpreting what's about to happen. The way these data will be changed will be based on taking the difference between two spectra and since the difference between two spectra will be the basis for the calculation we must have a good binding energy scale so 
as best we can, we need to align these data to account for any differences in the surface potential when these measurements were taken. And what we'll do is we'll make an assumption here. And the assumption is that the sodium ions will all generate peaks at the same binding energy. Now this is an assumption, but nevertheless it's the one we're going to work with. So we'll perform a calibration in terms of energy and this will be performed using a region and the region will be defined and upon, over this region the maximum intensity will be calculated and it'll be used to align these sodium peaks so first of all I've defined a background and I've used the background minimum and the reason I've used minimum is because uh, these data were acquired and the lower binding energy side of this peak has been cut off and as a result it's difficult to actually identify how to calculate the background for this peak even if it's just a simple linear background so what I'm going to use is just a, a, a minimum that's based on the left hand side so this this is the side that's going to determine this background very simple background I don't want to introduce any artifacts that will alter the shape of this and the position of the peak maximum and then I need to propagate this region to the selected sodium 1s peaks having done so I'm going to use the spectrum processing dialog window and go to the calibration property page and having selected one of these regions I'm going to bring in the position as calculated here from the region just so that I can reference all of these measurements to a specific value now as it happens you can see that this is a very precise it's 0 0.8000 so this isn't going to be too meaningful and that's because we've got a certain step size that has been used to get these peaks and it is having an influence on the peak position so what I'm going to do is I'm going to tick this box here that says calculate maxima and what that does is it puts a polynomial through the top of the peak and calculates the maximum of that polynomial as an estimate for the peak position so now you can see when I select I get more precision whether it's correct is another matter but it's it means that it's not dictated to the peak position by the increments that we use to measure these spectra and it is a an approximation a better approximation than if we just gone with the raw data peak bins we'll also adjust the region and components and what I'm going to do is I've got sodium selected and I'm going to use this applied by row first region now first region refers to the region that's in column A so this is the one that's going to be calculated there's just one region here so it's unique if there were more regions it would always be the one in the first column in column A that would be used in this calculation and what it's going to do is use the region to calculate the peak position I've specified a true value and this will be applied to the set that are selected and for each sodium 1s spectrum it'll calculate a position calculate an offset and apply that offset to each and every VAMAS block in the same row as the sodium 1s spectrum and it'll do it for all four rows so when I press this button here these peaks should then all align and not only do these peaks all align in theory if I now step to the sodium 2p you can see that the sodium 2p given that there's a an oxygen 2s up here that's interfering with the, the sodium 2p therefore you might find some shifts going on here due to the oxygen they, they look reasonably well aligned the sodium 2p and sodium 2s that looks very well aligned ignore the lithium 1s that was the transition that was assigned to these data based on the acquisition but it turns out that there's no lithium and what what has happened is that the uh, sodium 2s has been 
acquired, which is quite useful for this exercise, because we can now see that the 2s and also the 1s, the opposite ends of the energy range, uh, have aligned quite nicely. So you might expect by interpolation and implication that the carbon has also been aligned quite well. Having calibrated these data so that the sodium 1s are all aligned, this means that we can now take a copy of these data to a new file so that we can preserve this calibration and allow us to work on these data using this temporary copy so that we can avoid undoing a calibration should we need to undo any kind of processing that we subsequently perform on these data. So this is just a bit of bookkeeping. I'm organizing it so that I take a pair of these carbon spectra and these have been shifted the intensity normalization on so there's the sodium 1s that's shifted so they align so we're going to assume that these two are shifted so the carbon 1s are in a position where I can take the difference of these two spectra and I could do it as an as a pair to see what comes up but in order to do it systematically, what I'm going to do is use an option on the calculator and it's different spectra. So it'll take what's in the active tile, so there are two of them, and when I take the different spectra, what happens is this is 100% of 1, that's in 0, and in 100, that's 100% of the other. And if I go down here and I select, say, 50%, that's exactly what it says. That's as if I just subtracted one from the other. Now, if I go up from here, I end up viewing a range of possible spectral forms. And let's take this one. So I'm taking a processed copy, and that's the one I've chosen. So now if I go in the other direction, I can find the complementary form of these two vectors. And these take on a slightly different shape. So here we go. Let's say there. That'll do. And I'll save that one. So what we have are now two new vectors and these have been calculated from these original ones that are in 0 and 100. So if I use these two vectors as basis functions in a least squares calculation where I target the original data and I press the generate spectra to create that least squares solution, I end up with a pair of spectral forms. Let's turn off normalization. So you can now see that there's at least one spectrum in here, but actually if I offset them you can see there are in fact two. The first one is the raw data, the second one is the least square solution, and they are almost exactly the same. So much so that when they overlay you can you cannot see there's a difference between them. And this second one here this has been calculated as the sum of these two. So, originally we had two spectral forms that were like this, and now we have an alternative perspective where we've got two spectral forms that look like this. And in terms of peak fitting, the idea is that you can now start evaluating whether there are patterns of peaks that make physical sense that could be applied to fitting your original data. So for example, here we could say, let's put in some peaks. And this is really for the sake of argument rather than being certain as to what the chemical states might be here. But if I go through and I create some component peaks that I can fit to the data, that this might be 
a set of peaks that are physically significant and do contribute to that shape that we see here and it would be very difficult to come up with such a pattern of peaks based on the original spectrum itself and if we go to this one and do the same trick again we create ourselves a background and enter some peaks once again we'll say fit Again, we find a new pattern of peaks that may indicate that we've got some kind of structure that would suggest carbon bonded to oxygen, some CC type component here. And again, such a structure, if I overlay these, well, it's more obvious in this case, but it's not as obvious that you'd have to have this component in order to complete the peak fit. So if I take these two and I select the two original spectra again and then well before I do that let me just make a small adjustment to the components. Let's call these component index we'll make that zero and this one will make this one one. So if I now overlay these, so these are going to be the target or rather the basis vectors for uh, least squares and I select these two that are the original spectra that we just copied through previously and then I'll do a least squares again. You can now see we've got a peak model that might have many more peaks than you would normally or have been comfortable entering into this shape. But if you can justify these as shapes that are consistent with some of the materials that you you have in in the samples then this peak model would make sense and it would make sense if you displayed it using the component peaks all filled so that represents a possible combination of materials that have contributed to forming this particular sample and similarly there's an that combination again would be really difficult to to work out based on the data itself but nevertheless because it, it's been broken down in terms of these components you have a an idea that this might be a possible solution so it gives you a, a tool for working through data and combining data in order to try and work out what might genuinely be within a peak model and the more data that you have the better it is the idea is that if you've got four of these carbon monoxide spectra all of which should have similar structures underlying these shapes then by repeating this operation using these four you can get an ever closer idea of what might be here and then you have to justify it in a physical sense.